हेलो गाइस वेलकम बैक टू माय चैनल गैमा डाई गैमा सो इन द प्रीवियस वीडियो आई डिस्कस्ड हाउ टू सॉल्व अ सिस्टम ऑफ लीनियर इक्वेशंस एंड आल्सो डिस्कस्ड द टाइप्स ऑफ सॉल्यूशंस यू कैन गेट एंड बेसिकली टॉक्ड अबाउट एक्जिस्टेंस एंड यूनिकनेस ऑफ सॉल्यूशंस नाउ दिस वीडियो आई एम गोन डील विद अ लिटल मोर एब्स्ट्रैक्ट कॉन्सेप्ट इन लीनियर एलजिब्रा concepts of vector spaces uh, subspaces and uh, related column spaces and, and so on so let's get started and I, i'm sure this will be like a, a big bridge between many videos because i remember using many different concepts in change of basis video or even the previous video explained some i mean just stated some concepts and ex- expected you to know but now I'm going to actually explain that. Okay, so let's let's start with what vector spaces are. Consider three elements U, V and W that lie in some set called a V. and uh, take d and c to be two real numbers i mean i don't think this is too much to ask now let's have certain rules set up that the sum of u and v should b- belong in uh, the set v capital v second rule is uh, this a number i call it a scalar times u should belong in capital v the third rule is there should exist a zero element such that zero plus any element of v should be equal to the the element of v plus zero which is basically itself and we are assuming that there, there are operations like addition are defined on this fourth is u plus v is v plus u so there is a commutativity com- condition here the fifth condition is uh, u plus v bracketed plus w is equal to u plus bracket v plus w so associativity is also required and there should exist a negative element such that negative element plus that element is equal to the zero element that we defined in rule number 3 seventh condition is some number times sum of two elements is number plus number times the first element plus the number times second element so distributivity condition eighth condition is a similar version of the seventh condition but for two different numbers c and d the ninth is a some sort of associativity of multiplication and now we are assuming that multiplication is also defined on this set we there should exist some one element some identity element because one times u is equal to u so given these 10 conditions if a set v if a set v satisfies all 10 conditions then it is a vector space i mean the i think more uh, more importantly the question we should ask is why the hell should we be concerned about vector spaces well let me put it this way when we're learning linear algebra we concern ourselves with uh, representing abstract concepts in terms of matrices and vectors and you know stuff that for even tensors if you want to rank stuff up 
then if this if this is the if this is the if these are the colors or the paint brush then then the paper or the canvas where we are going to paint all and everything the canvas or the paper where we're going to paint everything is this notion of vector spaces I mean linear algebra is done on elements of vector spaces hence the term vectors if you want to think about it that way I mean the essence of linear algebra actually lies if you think about it in the first two conditions of the vector space and this this fact is actually elaborated in the concept of subspaces but before going to subspaces let me give you examples of vector spaces so that it's clear the first example that i can give you is a set of continuous functions if you have one continuous function f another continuous function g call that set c if you add two continuous function it is going to be continuous if you scale a continuous function it's still going to be continuous zero is can be considered a continuous function adding two continuous functions is again addition is regular addition the way we know since elementary school is commutative it is associative there exist negative continuous functions same associative uh, same distributivity applied here for rule 7 and 8 and uh, associativity of multiplication is also implied I mean, if you multiply to continuous function is still going to be continuous but we don't need that here c and d are scalars and of course the one is also a continuous function so one times any continuous function is that continuous function itself so this is certainly a vector space another example is a set of polynomials of say degree k for example uh, arbitrary degree i mean you can check you can go through all of these like a checklist and notice that the two are vector spaces now the most important example the third one i'm going to give is a set of uh, differentiable functions i mean if uh, if f and g are now differentiable functions summing two differential functions is still differential is, is is still a differential function you can check that with the the sum of derivative rule and all these other conditions are just implied this is very important because when we treat uh, differential equations in terms of you know linear algebra linear transformations the fact that we can do this treat them as linear transformations or you know involve linear algebra is because they are vector spaces and as i said you know linear linear algebra is the colors or the paint brush when vector spaces are the vector spaces and subspaces are the paper or the canvas that's why everything is connected it's like a big jigsaw puzzle okay now let's let's move on to the idea of subspaces okay moving on to subspaces now the conditions for subspaces is that first firstly let's have a set t should be a subset of a vector space v where v is a vector space
and let's let's now take uh, x and y to be elements of t and c to be a real number r on r basically the first condition is that the, the zero element should belong in the set t second condition is x plus y x and y are already elements of t x plus y should also be an element of t and lastly a scalar times x should also be an element of t this is this is what you call closed under addition and this is what you call closed under scalar multiplication and the, and the and, and if the, all these conditions are satisfied that's when t is a subspace of vector space v subspace you can think about is like a small version of a vector space inside a vector space so when you think about it in terms of sets v is a subspace of v any vector space is a subset of a uh, subspace of itself and the conditions are way few for proving that, uh, showing that anything is a subspace so instead of going through all this uh, checklist of 10 items it's always easier to check for these things to show that that stuff stuff are stuff is a subspace rather than showing that it's a vector space so it's a i think it's a way more practical notion of sub, uh, the subspace notion is a way more practical way more useful one compared to the, that of the vector spaces because it's way easier to show now it's time for examples uh the first example is r3 three dimensional cartesian plane if you think about it with elements x y and z zero is part of the origin is definitely part of r3 you add two points say x1 y1 z1 to say x2 y2 z2 that is still going to be part of r3 if you scale this its length will increase and it will still be in r3 fine second one is symmetric matrices of order 2 by 2 well zero can be considered a symmetric matrix the null the null matrix is a symmetric matrix summing two symmetric matrices will also be a symmetric matrix scaling them will also be symmetric so indeed and the best one is a plane containing the origin now if a plane didn't contain the origin it would not be a subspace by definition because we need the zero element if it didn't contain the origin it would satisfy to conditions 2 and 3 but it won't satisfy satisfy condition 1 and that's important so look out for this this is really important now the the essence of linear algebra the way i like to put it lies in understanding lies in actually clubbing conditions 2 and 2 and 3 clubbing 2 and 3 why it's because say if we choose another scalar d instead of just c you can combine 2 and 3 to get this cx plus dy should belong to t where x and y belong to t and c and d belong to r and this what we did here scalar times an element plus another scalar times another element 
is what we call a linear combination and this this term is we use it all the time in linear algebra and even the solutions to differential equations solutions to uh, differential equations if you have one solution x naught and you have another solution x1 then a linear combination of those solutions is also a solution x2 for example and this notion is is really really important because i'm going to discuss about what what what, what do you mean by span or linear dependence and independence on a fresh page so see you there okay so what do we mean by linear dependence first if you have some element of a vector space and i'm i'm bold enough to call it a vector now and if we can express that as a linear combination i'm again using linear combination that i explained on the previous page a1 times one vector v1 plus a2 times another vector v2 plus an times the last vector vn if you can express an arbitrary vector vk as a linear combination of other vectors then this vector vk is linearly dependent on the other vectors v1 through vn and to give you a, a geometric idea of what this means say if you have two vectors that are linearly dependent two vectors that are linearly dependent are parallel to each other that's the idea behind it because you can express the the taller vector as a linear combination of the first one and a linear combination of just one vector is just a scalar times that vector but if you have say two vectors 1 2 3 3 1 1 and a linear combination of them 4 3 4 so 4 3 4 is clearly de linearly dependent on the first vector and the second vector because you add both of them up you take a1 is equal to 1 a2 is equal to 1 add them up you get this this guy 4 3 4 So what that means is say one two three is like this. Three one one is suppose like this, then four three four will lie in the linear combination of them, and this linear combination of them will be this entire plane that will contain the origin because it's a subspace. and this instead of just you know calling it uh 4 3 4 lies in the linear combination in the linear combination instead of using this linear combination term there's a way more effective term and we call it the span so 4 3 4 lies in the span of these two vectors 1 2 3 3 1 1 that is linear dependence now linear independence is just the opposite which means if you can't if you cannot express a vector as a linear combination of the other so one vector doesn't lie in the span of the others By the way, in this in this or top uh, linear dependence definition, v one, v two, v n are mutually linearly independent. Because if they were dependent, we could just club whichever ones were uh, linearly dependent with to each other, and then you know choose a better coefficient and just write them as one vector. 
so a vector is linearly independent if it does not lie in the span of the others and so the best test for linear dependence or independence is uh, row reduction so you have something like this you can row reduce this easily 1 0 0 2 0 0 and uh, the, the the column with the pivot the pivotal column is the line, linearly independent vector while the the free column one without the pivot non pivotal column is the linearly dependent vector and you can check for uh, the previous example we had here 1 2 3 3 1 1 4 3 4 if you row reduce it completely you have 1 0 0 0 1 0 1 1 0 and you can see clearly that 1 1 0 can be expressed as 1 0 0 plus 0 1 0 but these are the reduced vectors what were the original vectors 1 2 3 and 3 1 1 so this is clearly linearly dependent but if we had a pivot in this last column to like a 0 0 1 then all three vectors would be linearly independent that's why the, the best the best example of three linearly independent vectors are the standard basis vectors 1 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 1 I mean this is the final state any ro ro matrix undergoing row reduction yearns to achieve right no way you combine these two vectors are you gonna get the third one or these two vectors are you gonna get the first one they are just unique because if you think about it linear dip, linear dependency is a measure is a measure of redundancy i mean are we repeating any information because if this linearly dependent vector which lies in the span of two linearly independent vectors it gives no new information because it's i mean this this shaded region was already being covered because we were we were taking the span of these two linearly independent vectors having this new vector here doesn't contribute much doesn't give us any new information i mean we could have reached this point which is which is you know which denotes this vector we could reach this point using these two vectors i mean there was actually no need even to have this new vector to represent a fresh point but if there was a vector that was pointing out of the page for example or into the page which was mutually perpendicular to these two vectors then that would be linearly independent because these two, using these two vectors you can only you can only cover you can only reach points in this entire plane you can't reach points that are perpendicular to the plane that's why we we want we are searching for fresh information or points you couldn't have reached using your old independent vectors Now that's why I would like to point out that three linearly independent vectors in R3 which are basically can be expressed as X, Y, Z something like this with three inputs span R3 entirely because if you consider vectors as columns of a matrix if you had any more vectors any more if you had more than three 
then you have more columns than the rows because your rows are just limited to three because you are in R3. So you have more columns than rows. And if you remember the previous video, that indirectly translates to having um, having some free columns because you can't have pivots in them because you're just running out of rows to have pivots. So if you have and if you have some free columns, what what did that mean? There is linear dependency there going on. So more than three vectors and you run the risk of being linearly in, uh, linearly dependent. And then it's 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 not it's not it's not clean. It, it it doesn't seem clean. And we want the maximum number of vectors that can actually the minimum number of vectors. that can span a given space. So more than three and you have the problem of linear dependence. So more than three is not a good idea. What about less than three? If you have less than three, then what happens is fine. You may, you may, you may have pivots in all columns and your matrix will have more rows than columns but the last row the last row would be completely redundant i mean the problem would be that you would be spanning a lesser space I mean, having lesser vectors is not a good idea because then you would be it's like, it's like the, the example I showed you. you would be stuck in a plane when your original space that you should be spanning is three dimensional. It has a vert vertical component to it too. That's what we have a, you have a geometrical basic, basic problem of because take, take this element three, four, three. No, you have you you are only given like two vectors. I mean, you can't reach this point with just these two vectors. I mean, even if you take this three and this four, you're missing a a z component to reach this. So there'll be some 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 uncovered space which will be less than R three, so it won't span R three. So since it, it can't be this, it can't be this, it has to be R is equal to C. And therefore three linearly independent vectors in R3 will span R3 entirely. And you can basically just increase the dimension of this. So K linearly independent vectors in RK span it. And, and, and the term we use for this uh, K linearly independent vectors is a basis. So these, they form a basis of RK. Why RK? Because that's the, that's the space they span. I mean, you can have something that was smaller, you know, have like a smaller vector space that they're spanning. Then in that case, it would be a basis for that. And the number of, uh, number of vectors, number of basis vectors is what we call the dimension. Hence the term K dimensional space. because of this linear algebra definition, not because of anything we knew before. 
so these are if you think about these are way more fundamental concepts okay now now let's actually deal with a little more serious stuff consider a system of linear equations ax is equal to b and you know a and b are matrix a is a matrix x and b are vectors you know stuff we dealt with in the last video so let's just write this as a matrix a11 a1 2 going on till a1m and then down we have a n1 a n2 a n m multiplied with this uh, x1 till uh, x m being equal to uh, b1 till b n okay and if we just uh, write this multiplication in a different way say x1 times this first column because remember we are treating columns as vectors x m times a1 m a n m and that is equal to b1 till b n ok let's just change notation a bit let's call this a1 vector I'm using this classic physicist notation xm am vector is equal to uh, b1 bn which is the b vector now this system ax equals b will have a solution if b vector lies in the span of a1 vector a2 vector going on till uh, am vector because that's exactly what it is we are we are seeing we are we are trying to find a linear combination the coefficients of the linear combination that that will result in b i mean we're trying to express B as a linear combination of these given column columns of the matrix. We're basically trying so this system will only have a solution if this condition is satisfied. What condition that B can be expressed as a linear uh, combination of these vectors, which means that B should lie in the span of these vectors if there has to be a solution. Because if B does not lie in the span then there is no solution or we call the inconsistent system okay and and this therefore we ex we introduce this idea of a column space which is basically the span of the column vector what you do is you take the columns of a matrix treat them as vectors and then get their span or a linear combination of them and this is a, a new perspective of looking at uh, systems of linear equations you just check whether that final vector you had can be expressed in terms of these basis vectors it, uh, whether it is in the span of those uh, fundamental column vectors and that's why uh, the change of basis is a matrix if you remember that video even change of basis required this sort of structure this sort of construction like linear combination of vectors now okay since we talked about ax is equal to b let's actually talk about ax is equal to 0 okay which means 
again from the previous case x1 times a1 vector plus x2 times a2 vector plus xm times am vector is equal to the zero vector okay which means if you just rearrange this stuff a little bit xm times am vector is equal to negative of all these other remaining vectors x1 times a1 vector plus x2 times a2 vector plus going on till basically x m minus 1 am minus 1 vector and then you divide by xm because xm is not zero otherwise this way this term wouldn't exist But x x1 over xm and x2 over xm are also scalars in their own right so you probably get a fresh scalar and and look what we have here this is exactly expressing This is exactly expressing am vector as a linear combination of these other remaining vectors which means am is in the span of the others and am is linearly dependent to the others now this can be avoided i mean you can show that th this assumption is wrong if you if you say that am a1 all the way to am are linearly independent in their own right because you can you can you can argue that if you take the matrix perform uh, your row reduction on it you will end up with the identity or you will end up with pivots in all columns then this assumption is wrong then the only way this equation is satisfied is when all these coefficients x1 x2 till xm are zero that's only when we we know for sure that all these vectors are linearly uh, independent so if if i say that row reduction rref converting matrices into rref is a test of uh, linear dependence then then this condition that whenever you have this equation the only possible solution is when the coefficients are zero is a test of linear independence because a linear dependent system will have other solutions as well like this and instead of x a, a am vector it could be any other vector from a1 to am so this is very important and uh, and since uh, having having pivots having pivots tells you that uh, since have uh, the the pivotal columns tell you that those vectors are linearly independent the free columns tell you that uh, those vectors are linearly dependent for example if you co consider this system now 1 2 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 3 
while the non pivotal ones which is 1 1 0 and 2 negative 1 0 are linearly dependent and moreover you can see how, how to construct these guys let me write the original ones instead of this 4 5 6 and this was negative 1 1 3 and, and with this we can you can actually see how to construct these guys this is telling you take one the top entry is telling you take one of uh, column one the bottom entry is taking telling you take one of column two same thing here two of column one negative one of column two that's why uh, four five six can be expressed as one times one two three plus one times three 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 and two negative one zero sorry I mean negative one one three is basically negative two times one two three as a positive two and negative one times the second guy which was three 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 it's just these coefficients I'm using over here and therefore we can construct a, uh, a vector that when multiplied with this matrix will give us zero or a null vector which is indeed a solution to this this ax is equal to zero you can treat this as being f of x is equal to zero in other in a more general way so to construct an, a null vector what you do is you take one corresponding to this uh, pivotal position this third third column then you take a third row one in that and the rest of the guys it's since it's one and one in, in linear combination take a negative of that negative one negative one because when you add all of these together you're gonna get zero this is vector one wait a minute because there's another guy this other guy you repeat the same procedure again take zero for the third guy because you don't need that like we didn't need the fourth one before negative 2 now just flip the sign negative 2 positive 1 and a 1 here both of these are elements of the so called null space and a null space is the span of these guys is a span of these guys and if you check again these two these two things are linearly independent because of check the one and zero position over here it's almost like a standard basis vector so these are the bases of the null space therefore you can describe the null space as being a span of these two vectors and that's exactly how we construct a null space so whenever we have a solution like this ax is equal to b the more general solution is a particular solution whatever you get after solving it using you know my techniques plus linear combination of the bases of the null space because anyways if you multiply with a a times the uh, basis of the null space are going to give zero by this definition that's how you construct a more general solution and that's the entire idea that I was actually trying to explain in the last video by the end. Now on examination we noted that uh, the pivotal columns that we had the pivotal columns told us what vectors are 
linearly independent and those linearly independent vectors became the bases of the column space the free columns the non pivotal columns told us naturally what vectors are linearly dependent therefore giving a basis of the null space as we just saw above now there is an important you know rule with matrices if if you write the columns the vectors as columns of a matrix you see that the number of pivotal columns plus the number of free columns is equal to basically the total number of columns of the basically the matrix because say if you have a matrix denoting rm to rn then you're going to have m m number of total columns so number of pivotal columns is basically the the number of the number of bases vectors for the column space and what what is the number of bases vectors called the dimension of the column space plus the dimension of the null space is equal to in this case the dimension of the the input space which is m is rm well there is a special term for the dimension of the column space it's called the rank the dimension of the null space is called the nullity m is just well i don't know the, the dimension and this is one of the most fundamental results in linear algebra this is called the rank nullity theorem i mean knowing the knowing the dimension of the column space you can get the dimension of the null space and vice versa so this is something that was really really important so i i hope you enjoyed this video guys i know it's pretty long but this had to be done i mean the amount of abstract information i gave out in this video is beats any other video please like share and subscribe to my channel guys recommend me to your friends spread the word of gamma diagram and the math community and in the meantime stay home stay safe keep doing math and peace out